So uh, today we're going to check with uh, the design of a cavity wall. Till date, we have checked with uh, the design of ordinary masonry wall, which is which is a solid wall, which has different uh, uh, scenarios that are involved. This is a solid wall with lateral support systems like piers involved over here. And this is another uh, scenario where you have cross walls that are uh, supporting the wall which we have to design, that is a different wall. And this is another scenario where there is no cross wall involved. It's just a single uh, solid wall that has to withstand all the loads that is happening on top of it. So uh, out of all these scenarios, these are all uh, solid walls uh, which we have worked on till date. And uh, today we're going to work on something which is uh, more recent, uh, the hollow wall uh, uh, paradigm. Uh, hollow walls are known for various, uh, uh, known, known for its advantages. Uh, the main thing is that it has uh, a better uh, resistance to uh, temperature effects. Any sort of uh, temperature or thermal effects that are happening, uh, hollow walls are said to be more uh, resistive in terms of uh, transmission of temperature. And they, they act as a really good insulating uh, 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 layer compared to that of your uh, ordinary solid walls. Because the uh, one thing is that they have this uh, empty space which is in between uh, those two uh, sandwiched walls. This empty void, air, air void which is happening in between uh, prevents the transmission of any sort of uh, thermal related uh, radiation or any such uh, temperatures uh, to be transmitted to the other side of this particular wall. Now, coming to the design, uh, when it comes to cavity walls, uh, this slightly uh, uh, has a different approach in terms of effective thickness. But apart from that, as far as its effective height, uh, effective length is concerned, everything is pretty much similar that of your solid walls. So uh, let's just directly dive into the example. Uh, this, is a, uh, this example is about a design of a cavity wall. This is of, uh, uh, it's an interior wall which is happening in three story building. Uh, the ceiling height of each story is three meters, as always. The height of the ceiling is three meters. Uh, I can just uh, depict that over here. As you can see, this is three meters. The wall is unstiffened and is 3.6 meter long. When they say unstiffened wall, it means that it is not supported by any uh, cross walls or any piers that is uh, to, to the actual wall that has to be designed. So this is an unstiffened wall, just like in uh, the first uh, example which we have seen. This is an unstiffened solid wall uh, where there is no support uh, system involved in terms of cross walls or in terms of piers. And uh, the example which we are seeing now, example four, is about uh, an unstiffened hollow wall. <coughs> so uh, when it comes to an unstiffened hollow wall, uh, uh, yeah, the width, the width is about 3.6 meters, just given in the question, uh, I have depicted over here, 3.6 meters in width. Uh, and the height and uh, the loads from the roof are taken as 12 kilometers per meter. This is from the roof, strictly the topmost uh, floor of the building, 12 kilometers. And from the floor, it's 10 kilonewtons per meter. That is per floor, so 10, kilo, uh, 10, 10 kilonewtons per meter for second floor, 10 kilonewtons per meter on the third, uh, first floor as well. So that's two stories, so two floors. The bottommost part is just ground level, so we're not considering that as a floor over here. So uh, let us just select the cavity wall with an overall thickness equal to 250 mm and the thickness of each leaf is equal to 100 mm. And the thickness is assumed for a calculation of self-weight and slenderness ratio. Now, uh, the thickness of this particular hollow wall is an assumption. You can change these assumptions, but uh, how you look at these assumptions is not something that has to uh, take more of uh, importance over here because when they say the overall thickness is 250 mm, this includes the end-to-end -end, uh, distance of the hollow wall which includes the air, air space in between as well. So that 0.25 meters, the overall thickness over here, and the thickness of each leaf is equal to 100 mm, that is each leaf, you call uh, these individual parts as leaves and each leaf is of, uh, of 100 mm. And of course, when you minus 250, uh, when you minus 200 from 250, you'll be left with 50, which is nothing but the air void which is happening in between. Next, moving on, uh, the weight of the roof and the floors. Okay, we are just trying to calculate the weight of the roof and floors over here. So the weight of the roof is given as 12 kilonewton per 
per meter as given in the question. Uh, plus two into 10, that's nothing but the two stories, two floors. So we're just multiplying two times uh, into the uh, load that is happening per floor. So two into 10, that totals to 32 kilonewton per meter. That is just the load that is happening by the virtue of roof, that is light load and dead load included. Now, uh, we have to add something called self-weight of the wall. We have considered the weight that is the dead load of the uh, slabs that are happening on each each uh, masonry wall, but now we'll have to consider the self-weight of individual wall as well. So in order to calculate self-weight, it's a straightforward approach. We are just multiplying uh, the length, width, and the height into the number of walls into its unit weight of that particular material, which is used for the masonry over here. So three is nothing but three walls, which we have for three stories, one, two, three into one, one is the unit length, which is being considered. We are not considering 3.6 meters here. We're considering unit length because everything is happening per unit meter. So into one, that is length, into two, two is nothing but two times the leaves. Okay, we are just multiplying the total thickness that this hollow wall uh, or total thickness that these leaves of the hollow wall will sum up to. That's two times 100 mm, that's 200 mm. So that will be 0.2 meter, that is the thickness of the hollow wall. I, uh, it's much safe to say that it is the thickness of the hollow wall without the air void. Next, three is nothing but the height, three meters, uh, two into 0 0.1 into three, that three is nothing but the height, three meters, and into 20, 20 is nothing but the unit weight of the masonry which is used over here. Uh, we are just considering brick masonry over here. Uh, I, I didn't depict this as a brick masonry. Uh, I can just uh, change it to brick masonry for a better uh, understanding. Okay, so so for this particular brick masonry, uh, the unit weight is considered as a 20 kilonewton per meter cube. Moving on, the total load, when you sum up the total live load and dead load of the slabs to the total Self weight of the particular uh, of all the masonry walls that are happening on each level that will sum up to 68 kilonewton per meter. Now, uh, once we know the total load that is happening by the virtue of dead and life, we 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 have the ability, we have the liberty to calculate the compressive stress that is developed by the virtue of the existing load that is happening over there. So, the compressive stress which is happening by the virtue of all these. Uh, uh, slabs and all the self weight of the brick masonry can be given as uh, 68,000. Uh, that is nothing but that converted into a, a smaller uh, unit. Uh, 68,000 by 2 into uh, 1,000 mm. Uh, sorry, 200 mm into 1,000 mm. 200 is nothing but the overall thickness of the wall. Again, uh, let's not just say overall thickness of the wall. It's the thickness of the individual leaves combined. So 200 into 100, uh, sorry, 1000 is the unit length which we are considering over here. Let me just uh, show you a cross section. So if you see over here, this is 100 mm, 100 mm, plus another 100 mm, that will sum up to 200 mm. Now the length, which we are going to take only unit meter, that is one meter. This is the unit meter. So uh, this is the area which we are considering uh, for that application of uh, load per unit meter. Of course, it extends all the way till the end, but our calculation is basically on per unit meter note. So the compressive stress developed is uh, 58,000 newtons by uh, uh, 200 into 1000 mm, that will give us a 0 0.34 newton per mm square. This is the compressive stress 
developed by the virtue of the existing uh, loads present on top of this particular structure. Now, moving on. Moving on. Uh, now, let's calculate the effective height. The effective height, again, there is no uh, a, a different approach when it comes to hollow wall. It's as similar to that of your solid wall. So, considering the restraint conditions that are happening on the, uh, the top and the bottom parts of the masonry wall, uh, this is a fully restrained condition. It's just uh, similar to that of your previous example. Uh, if you see your IS code in table 4, in table 4, the restraint condition, uh, if it's fully restrained on both sides, top and bottom, we'll be having 0 0.7 times its height. So we're just multiplying 0.75 times its actual height. So that is 0 0.75 into 3 meters, that will give us 2.25 meters or 2250 mm. That is the effective height of that particular masonry wall. Moving on, effective thickness. Now, the thing about effective thickness, this is where uh, uh, the, the approach changes when it uh, when we try to differentiate between solid wall and uh, hollow wall. For a solid wall, effective thickness is usually actual thickness, but when it comes to hollow wall, there is uh, a different approach in calculating the effective thickness. If you see uh, in the IS code, if you go to effective thickness, calculation of effective thickness, um, Yeah, effective thickness under cross 4.5.4, 4.5.4. For cavity walls with both leaves of uniform thickness throughout, the effective thickness is to be taken as two thirds of the sum of the total thickness on of the two leaves. That is nothing but we are trying to add these two leaves. We are trying to add the total thickness uh, of these two leaves, 100 mm plus 100 mm, and we are going to multiply with Two by three. We are taking only two thirds of the total thickness of both the leaves combined. We are going to completely ignore the air space which is in between that is 50 mm in this case. So, in that regard, uh, two, two thirds of 200 mm that will be 113 mm. That is the effective thickness that is happening for this particular hollow wall. Now, the slenderness ratio, effective height by effective thickness. So you're just going to multi uh, divide uh, 22.5 meter by, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 2,250 mm by 133 mm. That will give us 17. That is a slenderness ratio. Now, for a slenderness ratio of 17, we are considering zero eccentricity over here. We are not going to eccentricity part for this uh, scenario. Yeah, in table nine, sorry, uh, in Yeah, in table nine, uh, which gives us the stress reduction factor for a slenderness ratio of 17 with zero eccentricity, that will be somewhere in between 16 and 18 with zero eccentricity, where you can linearly interpolate these values. The value will be somewhere in between. I think it will be somewhere around the 0 0.7. Uh, yeah, the slenderness ratio is somewhere around uh, 0 0.74. Sorry, uh, that is a basic simplicity strength. Yeah, I think it will be somewhere around 0 0.7. So, uh, the, st the stress reduction factor obtained uh, from that particular table, table uh, 9, by linear interpolation, we get 0 0.7. Yes, please correct this uh, 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 0.54. It is not 0 0.54, it is 0 0.7. So, the stress reduction factor is 0 0.7. Now, considering the bricks crushing strength as 7.5 Newton per mm square with a motor grade of M1, uh, the brick crushing strength is obtained as 0 0.74. That is a basic compressive stress that is obtained from table 8. If you can recall, in table 8, which we have a basic compressive stress for machinery units, in table uh, for M1 and a crushing strength of 7.5, we have 0 0.74 as the basic compressive stress. Now, we are trying to multiply the stress reduction factor to basic compressive uh, stress in order to get the allowable or permissible stress that can be uh, uh, used or that can be used to check whether our assumption for that particular wall thickness is good 
uh, is it safe or not so when we try to multiply uh, sorry um, yeah when we're trying to multiply 0.7 to 0.74 that is the basic compressive stress to the stress reduction factor that is obtained from table 9 we get 0.52 which is the allowable stress uh, 0.52 is the allowable stress but uh, if you if you check 0.34, which you get in the compressive stress that is developed by the by the virtue of the loads that are happening, the actual compressive stress that is happening because of the existing loads that are on uh, in this scenario, it is far less compared to that of the allowable stress. The allowable stress is somewhere around 0.52 unit per mm square, but the basic compressive stress that is developed on physical site is 0.34 newton per mm square. So since the allowable is much more greater, there is more room for uh, more load. So hence, we can say that the entire structure is under a safe note. So this is uh, the example which I want to discuss when it comes to cavity walls. Uh, not much of a difference compared to the of others. Uh, just the effective thickness is varying a bit. But apart from that, all the design analogy is quite similar. Uh, so is the design analogy, if there are any little restraints, if there are any little peer, uh, little support systems like piers or buttresses that are happening, even it will be more or less similar to that of a solid wall, but the effective thickness is something that you have to keep in mind when it comes to the design of cavity walls. With that, I'll end this session. Uh, you, you can feel free to ask any questions. Uh, on my mail, uh, I'll be I'll be willing to answer any of the questions you have. Thank you.